In this video, I turn Wilbur Soot and Charlie Slimesicle's item game from Tommy and It's Lava Ravine video into an actual playable game that you could play in Minecraft. If you do like the video or the game, please feel free to subscribe, because we're getting super close to 40,000 subscribers. Enjoy! Okay, so the game itself is called Chesticuffs. It's super weird, very improvisational, and therefore, very complicated. I watched both Tommy's main and second channel videos on the game a few times, and created a game which fits most, if not all, of the things that Will and Charlie say or do in the actual video. In this video, then, I'm going to do three things. 1. Explain a basic layout of how the game itself will work. 2. Showcase some of the cooler items. And 3. Run through a bit of the back end on why this game is so weird and yet strangely good? Anyway, the way the game itself works. Basically, the premise of the game is that it's like a trading card game almost. You play your cards on a field of some sort and try to reduce your opponent's health to zero. In this game, however, there is another twist. The core mechanic. The aim of the game here is to either reduce your opponent's HP to zero or to steal their core. Either works and either will win you the game in the conventional manner. But before we get to the actual playing, how do you even get the items you play? My idea for this would be that you and your friend who you're playing against would play the game almost like bingo in the start. You both log on to the realm or server which you want to play on, preferably a new world, and give yourselves a time limit in which you're allowed to collect your items or cards. I think the sweet spot for this limit would be around 10 to 15 minutes, though you're free to change that as you wish when you play yourselves. Then, after the time limit is over, you and your friend go get teleported to a room with a single chest and a crafting table. That's it. Once you're both in the room, you're ready to start playing. You both generally play a core or a nexus as your first move, and what this item does is basically power up every single other item you play. Your core is what ties your deck together. This means that in the bingo phase, there are two main playstyles. Either you scour the overworld for easy to obtain and farm items like flowers or seeds, or you take a risk and try to plunge into like the nether or caves to try and get diamonds or nether items. There's a definite risk reward factor that comes into play here, because the weaker, easier to get decks rely heavily on variety and number rather than one or two easy to obtain heavy hitters like the stronger ones. Also, every item has two types, like farming, tools, precious, animals, flowers, like Pokemon almost. For example, a diamond axe is of the type precious and tool, whereas a warped fungus is of the type plant and nether. These types both help and hinder the items, as they are what chooses how items are buffed, debuffed, and affected by other items. After you've both played your cores, turn one is over and the process repeats. What's interesting here is that there's no cap on the number of items you can play per turn, though there is a cap on the type of item you could play. What this means is that basically you can play 6 wheat seeds, sure, but you can't play 1 wheat seed and paper. Again, there's an exception here thanks to Wilbur, which means that you can play 3 wheat together and then selectively evolve one of them into a hay bale, but again, to evolve you need to have the items to do so. It's also worth noting that showing your entire hand at the start of the game basically guarantees a loss, given that the opponent knows exactly how to counter your every move. In addition to this, it's also very hard to remove cards from play, and this effectively balances out the lack of a cap on the number of items you can play, because if you clog up your field trying to clinch a win early, your opponent can counter all your moves and since it's hard for you to remove cards from play, you're left helpless. Anyway, you've both played your cores and a few more items, and here's what's very interesting. From turn 3, you're allowed to attack. That means you have time to set up defenses in the early game so that your core doesn't instantly get taken, but also allows for quick, fast-paced gameplay from decks which try to win before heavy-hitting combos can be set up. After the third turn then, players take turns attacking. There are a bunch of rules for this, but in essence, one item per turn attacks another item, and the difference in attack and defense is dealt as damage to your opponent. Both you and your opponent start with 20 HP, and a win condition is met when one player's HP is reduced to zero. A card which loses a battle in essence, which didn't have high enough defense to beat the player, gets removed from play. This makes attacking a very strategic game, because going for higher damage points and attacking weaker cards frees up the opponent's playing field of those early weak cards that they had to play, letting them set up combos and deadly attack methods without having to go through the trouble of a recall. It's also possible to chain attacks. Chaining attacks is actually something I added myself without any inspiration from Charlie and Wilbur, just because I like the strategic potential it holds. If an attacking card beats the defending card by more than 3 points, it's possible to chain the attack, attacking again in the same phase and swiftly thinning the enemy field, weakening them and setting yourself up for a good offensive position. There's one last mechanic I want to talk about here, though there are a few more in the rules document down below, and that mechanic is called 
core shifting. Again, completely ad-libbed and just made up by Charlie to stop himself from losing. When a player is summoning cards for their next turn, if the spot to the right or left depending on the side of the core is empty, it's possible to core shift. This allows for two things. One, the player gets to pick a new core and two, the old core is shifted to the core defending position. The trade-off with core shifting is that although you gain the versatility and fluidity of being able to completely change your playstyle in one turn, your core is left undefended in the middle row making it susceptible to attack. If you intentionally set up a core shift, there's a very high possibility that your opponent will play a headstrong attack card in the middle row and take your core before you can execute your master plan. Alrighty, so those are the mechanics all done basically. So now it's time for a quick showcase of the items, as well as the reasons for those super weird mechanics. So probably my favourite item in the game and also one of the most overpowered items, melon seeds. These things wouldn't seem overpowered if you were making this game from scratch, but since Wilbur decided to make them such sellout pay to win cards in the video, I thought hell, why not make them incredibly OP in the game I'm making as well. So now these things have nearly the highest defence possible in every single position, making them a literal wall which most cards can't get through, and that's all that Wilbur did in the video, sure. However, I have no idea when to stop, so now if any other farming type card is on the field with Melling Seeds, including for example the extremely easy to obtain and extremely weak Wheat Seeds, you can evolve them both into Melons, which have the highest defense possible and a decent attack. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's a thing. Maybe, maybe try to avoid using jungle spawns for this game, eh? <laughs> Another item I thought was pretty cool was the Acacia Door. Now, if you watched the original video, you'll know that Charlie playing two Acacia Doors together won him the game against Wilbur. The only thing is, they don't say that the doors themselves are overpowered. Instead, they're an item that can be used whenever and therefore are probably balanced. So I had to somehow balance this game-finishing item into, well, a normal item. And here's how I did that. First, I made the door super weak in most if not all positions. It has barely any attack no matter what, and its defense is average at best. The only real time it has any value is when two of them are played in an uber attack position. And remember, their attack and defense in this position is very bad. What they do in this position, however, is allow for an attack before the attack phase of the game has even started, making it plausible for Charlie's play here to win the game, but also meaning that when you play a door in uber attack, you're clogging up the spot with a card that can't really do much, except for allow for this extra attack. In addition to this, there's a bunch of cool ideas you could test out with the whole deck system. Since items are grouped based on how they're found, it's almost impossible not to build a singular deck, if not a hybrid, which means that, for example, uh, the nether deck, as you can see in Willow's infantry here, is both hard and easy to get, because once you're in the nether, it's not a chore to get these relatively abundant items, which all power up and complement each other, especially when played correctly. And finally, with the cool and perfectly balanced item showcase over, let's talk a bit about why making this game was so… weird. You see, the way this game was made was an improvisational bit, and the thing is with improv that there is this rule that both Charlie and Wilbur followed, called the yes and rule. You never say no to someone else's suggestion in improv, you always accept it and build on it further. Which means that as the video progressed, the yes ands built up taller and taller, till the rules went from ha bonk item win game, to core shifting into core defensive position to play a more strategic nexus for the current field. Like here, for example, where Wilbur invents the idea of a core, or here where he evolves wheat into a hay bale for a defensive play, or here, for example, where Charlie both shows that you can't recall items easily and that you don't have to instantly play items in the core. The game got more and more complex over time, but somehow that helped to balance it just a bit? Not that this game is very balanced, but given all the weird and wacky yes and that Charlie and Wilbur added, it made it easy to write in subtle balancing factors which made the game a little more fair than, well, a uh, bonk item win. There is a free download of the rules as well as the stats for every single item in the video linked in the description, and that is the game. Bye!